tonight. He is sick with the flu and cannot make it, so we won't be hearing for, from any of those candidates. Uh, but aside from that, let's go ahead and have the candidates for the general land office come up. Debbie Edwards, Jerry Patterson, Rick Range, and I believe Andy Pryor has also joined us, and we've made a slot for him. So uh, just across the line over here, I've been a neighbor all my life. And I would tell you all, I was really tickled when they did the ballot draw because all the counties in the state I wanted to get number one. And it was Tarrant County and I got number one. So please be sure to tell everybody to check the number one box for me. And uh, But as y'all know, this is the biggest Republican vote county in the state outside of Harris County now. So anyway, luck of the draw, but I'm sure glad I got it. Uh, I want to run for the land office to restore integrity, productivity, and accountability to the land office, uh, plain and simple. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Commissioner George P. C. Bush has pretty well made a disaster of every aspect of the office that you could think of, from the Alamo to the storm victims to everything else, to firing all of the good people that he fired. Uh, you just go down the list. But the main thing uh, that's the most urgent, of course, is the Alamo reimagined plan. And we've got to do something fast on that. Uh, my approach would be to go in and immediately start implementing the plan that was passed and funded by the state legislature three years ago. It was an excellent plan. Uh, it would restore and preserve the structures, get the traffic off the streets, close the streets. Uh, get rid of the freak shows, get in a brand new battle museum for the artifacts, and more feasible, rebuild the 1836 battle footprint. And uh, it's a great plan. Unfortunately, when Mr. Bush got in there, he totally just dismissed it and brought in all these out-of-state people. Uh, and uh, they came up with this monstrosity called Reimagine the Alamo, which is, I guess, a good name. It's really Reimagine the Way to Battle. Uh, is the gist of it. That's why they want the cenotaph out of there. They want it to be uh, basically a Disney-style theme park to raise money for the city. So that is what we absolutely have got to stop, and that's the most urgent matter. And we need to get in there and move soon, because if not, we're going to lose that Phil Collins collection. He put a seven-year time limit on the thing. Bush has already squandered over four years of that. So we've got to have somebody go in there and start this and get it going immediately. Um, the other thing I would say is the issue is pretty well known, I think, here in Tarrant County and the Dallas area is my sense of it is getting pretty well spread, and I'll mention this more later, but we have got to get the word spread to the rest of the state. There are counties in this state where they know absolutely nothing about this, like 80, 90 percent of them, and that's got to change, and that's got to change fast. I'll mention that more later. Time for me to stop. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jerry Patterson, and I want to start off with a question. Where's George? <laughs> I don't know how many events have occurred, but not one that I've attended. Have you attended one for Commissioner Bush? Have you attended one for Commissioner Bush? That's what you've got now. That's not leadership. That's arrogance and elitism. So, one thing about this race. you got three gentlemen up here from which to choose. We're all friends. And if there's, if there's a runoff, I will be voting for whoever's in that runoff with great, great enthusiasm and working for their election. But the question becomes, who is most likely, if in a runoff, to be George P. Bush? And I'll talk about that a little later. But I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I am uh, born in Houston, 
Uh, went to Texas A&M where I crammed a normal four-year course of study Woo! in only five and a half years. <laughs> Finished in the top 75% of my class and joined the United States Marine Corps where I served for 24 years, 10 years active and 14 years reserved, including a tour uh, in Vietnam at the very end of the war. As a proud papa, I'd like to throw in the fact that my son, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Travis, named after William Barrett, Lee, named after, yes, that's correct, politically maybe, but incorrect, uh, is also a, a veteran of uh, combat in the War on Terror. And his current assignment is to fly Marine One for our President Trump. If you go to my website, we just put a picture up today of patterns of uh, Travis landing on the White House line, cockpit windows open, and he's kind of looking out this way as the President walks off the plane. Anyway, I'm very proud of my son. He's the fifth consecutive generation of our family to have served overseas during wartime, going back to the war between the states. Uh, I was in the legislature for six years. I'm probably best known as the author of Texas Concealed Handgun Law. I'd like to get a quick show of hands of those of you who have been involved in a shootout at a four-way stop since we passed that bill. The point I make is the main... Mr. Hand Razor. Mayhem has never occurred, and I guess until this lady right here came tonight. Uh, I want to tell you, when I was at the land office, we did several things. We set records for income in our 12 years, that we made $8.1 billion, which was more than the entire 124 years prior. We doubled the veterans' benefits, the largest increase in veterans' benefits since the end of uh, World War II, and I sat down uh, over an expensive lunch at Thunderclouds and negotiated with Bill Collins to donate his entire Alamo collection to the Alamo. I can get things done, I can win in a runoff, and that is extremely important because George P. Bush is not here to ask for your vote, nor will he ever be. Good evening, my name is Andy Pryor, and unlike the three gentlemen that are joining me up here at the dais, I am running as an independent uh, to be on the November ballot as the conservative alternative, assuming that we have a Democrat and a Democrat life. You want to have somebody to vote for, and that's my plan. Uh, my background is quite varied. I was born here in Texas. My parents were actually Republican precinct chairs back in the 80s during the Reagan years. I helped raise money to donate to various conservative causes as a child back then. During my adult years, uh, I've been involved in a number of efforts uh, here across Texas, whether it be the local level or state level, advocating on conservative causes, liberty causes, constitutional causes. Uh, my background personally is as a, uh, in the athletic world, mostly as coach and athlete. Uh, I also have a small background in the financial world. I have a little bit of a jack of all trades doing quite a few different things. Um, looking at this particular race, the reason which I finally decided to ultimately jump into this race was after talking with a couple of friends of mine who are veterans and hearing about the other issues besides the Alamo. The Alamo is the big headline. The Alamo is what's going to grab the crowd's attention and is exactly the biggest, most urgent, current thing. But the Land Commissioner's Office is a broad office with a lot of other responsibilities and if you don't pay attention to those other issues, uh, you're going to end up with somebody who's overly focused and narrowly focused. And that's what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to provide a broader attention span and look at everything that's going on and why exactly is George P. Bush failing the state of Texas and all of us Texans who were born here in his job as land commissioner. I know I've got a couple more seconds of time uh, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap up now because I know that y'all are going to love getting home a little early tonight and not being here until midnight. Thank you. Well, I'm Baby Edwards, and as uh, Andy said, uh, we do have some issues. Uh, it is a big responsibility. The headlines are the Alamo, but when you, the answer to your question of why they are being neglected is because when George P. Bush got into office, the first thing he did was implement a plan called Reboot the General Land Office. He got rid of hundreds of years of combined applicable experience in the, in the departments 
that, that needed them the most, such as disaster relief recovery. And those people down in Hurricane Harvey area not even getting into their homes yet. As I said, I'm Davey Edwards. I've spent the last 15, two decades of my life preparing to run for this position. But God knew I couldn't get there based off of qualifications alone. As a land surveyor, a licensed state land surveyor, I know the ins and outs of what the primary responsibility of the land office is. But, unfortunately, the Alamo has become an issue. And I'm a sixth generation Texan. And I'm passionate about our Texas heritage. And I'm passionate about protecting and preserving the Alamo. And one thing that I would like to do, once I'm elected into the office, is to get in there, implement the 2011 statute that says preserve, protect, and maintain the Alamo architectural and historical integrity. I'd like to get the Daughters of the Republic back in an advisory role so that they can, they have a century of information that is no longer there. They need to be back in that role. I'd like to see the Alamo not politicized again. How that's going to come out, how that's going to play, I don't know. But we need accountability to whoever is in that role. They need to be answering to the state of Texas. I've been around the entire state of Texas now. I've talked to Texans. Their primary objective, what they want to see, and the role of the next commissioner is to preserve and protect the Alamo. But I got the qualification to take care of the other duties of the general land office. And so that's why I want your vote come March 6th. March 6th, 1836, the Alamo fell, and up from the ashes, a great nation rose. March 6, 2018, the voters are going to go to fight for who's going to protect and preserve the Alamo. Some of the candidates have already touched on some of the general responsibilities of GLO, the General Land Office, and that includes uh, obviously overseeing the Alamo, working with Texas veterans, managing uh, debris removal and beach renourishment along the Gulf Coast, but it also includes overseeing a multi-million dollar fund called the Texas Permanent School Fund, which holds and invests resources for public education in Texas. My question is, and I'll start with Mr. Patterson, what is your assessment of how the Permanent School Fund is being managed and what changes, if any, would you make to the management of the Permanent School Fund? Well, well, I have to say, and I'm trying to be honest, that's one of the areas that the current commissioner hasn't screwed up. Uh, when I uh, was a land commissioner, all we were doing were was taking royalty income and sending it over to the State Board of Education for investment into the corpus of the fund. We got the legislature to change the rule, change the law, and we began investing in real property interest. By the time I left, in those 12 years, we made $8.1 billion in the 124 years prior, going back to 1874, the total amount made was $7.9 billion. It was because we diversified our income stream from just being reliant on oil and gas. And that has continued. I do know uh, the highest paid, paid employee at the land office manages that fund, and I think he's making about $300,000, and he's worth every penny of it. So the changes that will be need to be made are none, but the execution may need to be looked at as far as FTEs and the ability to get the job done. It is extremely important that people recognize that this fund is very important. All of your school taxes are lower because the Permanent School Fund guarantees those bond issues. Was it not for the uh, Permanent School Fund, your taxes would be higher. We have to make sure that the things that I implemented when I was commissioner continue, and I think that uh, I will do that and improve as necessary. I will one more comment. Of all the institutional funds in the state of Texas, we got PSF, we got PUF, we got ERS, we got TRS, we got all these things. Our fund had the highest internal rate of inter return consistently, even when other funds were losing money. I've been there, done that, and we'll do it again. 
I didn't have enough time in my introduction to say one more thing about my background, my family's background. <clears throat> my family has a combined 100 years of education experience in every form of education you can imagine. Public school, charter school, private school, home school, international school, overseas and across the United States. That's just between my parents and myself. Okay? So just two generations, 100 years of education experience. The one thing that I would change is as land commissioner, I would be knocking on the legislature's door, providing advice and information on why they are wasting the money that we've been making in the land commissioner's office with how they're spending it across the state on education that is failing Texas' students. I would be an advocate for Texas' students in this effort. That's something that I think sets me apart from any of the other candidates running for land commissioner, regardless of party affiliation. Now, I do agree with the fact that the, the, the permanent school fund being diversified and generating more funds is a good thing, but how it's being spent is just as important as how much money we're generating for that fund, and that's why we need to have that discussion. And so far, we're not. That's what I try to bring to this. Mr. Edwards. I, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Patterson. I think that right now that is one department that's actually uh, has been pretty consistent with the diversifying the uh, money coming in from the oil and gas leases and the sale of the uh, school lands. Uh, one thing that I think and, and I think y'all can probably relate to is that it has a direct uh, relation to the oil and gas industry. Uh, so when the market is up, then more money is invested, the market's down, and we see a direct impact on the school fund. The, the diversified portfolio is good that we can, uh, you know, we can keep the interest money coming out and going into public education, but I think we also need to work with the Railroad Commission in that we can uh, take some of that regulation off of the oil and gas industry so that they can get out there and get to our resources so that we can bring in what we And Mr. Range. Well, I would agree with what all three gentlemen had to say. I would like to emphasize the fact that the results we're getting from the educational funds spent uh, do not match the amount expended. That needs to be changed uh, in a big way. Uh, I would also say one thing I would want to ensure is that the oil and gas lease, leases, the way the contracts are structured, they need to be, if they're not already, uh, set up so that the permanent school fund is getting the maximum amount of revenue from those oil leases, not making these oil companies rich and richer. Uh, that would be a priority to me, to look at all those contracts and make sure we were getting absolute maximum benefit. And then the last thing I would say is, uh, somebody asked me the other day about what about wind and solar, and I said, well, those are great possibilities. And uh, one that's very interesting is uh, this offshore wind farm uh, idea, which I think shows a lot of promise because uh, it's totally 100% non-polluting, it's not on the land, it's not uh, cluttering up the land, and you can have a ton of them. And I think in the future, that may be more and more of the direction that we need to go. It's certainly something that needs to be looked at. I think it's, it's a really good idea and holds a lot of promise. All right, I'm going to go ahead and invite everybody to start queuing up if you've got questions. And while we're waiting for uh, people to get their questions prepared, I'm going to give each of you a minute, starting with Mr. Pryor, to uh, tell, tell the audience where you think you see yourself eight years from now. 60 seconds. I believe in eight years I'll be doing exactly what I've been doing the last few years, which is continue to advocate for liberty and constitutional principles on a variety of subjects. Last year at the state legislature, I went down and citizen lobbied on education issues, ballot access issues, 
property rights issues, uh, life, uh, very, very important uh, equal protection rather than just the say-so bills that they keep passing that really don't actually provide equal protection. Uh, so that's where I see myself in eight years' time, uh, continuing to fight for all Texans on very important issues that impact all of us. Mr. Edwards? Eight years from now, I will be probably have decided whether I'm running for re-election as land commissioner for the second or the third time. Um, and if not, I will be uh, going back into my land survey, my dad's land surveying practice as a consultant to uh, put the record of, of the land back on the ground or in education and teaching other surveyors how to uh, be a surveyor. But I make strong consideration about running for three terms as a commissioner uh, at that point. Mr. Range? <laughs> Well, that's one uh, issue that Mr. Uh, Edwards and I disagree on. I, if elected, I will serve only one four-year term. I'm not using this as a stepping stone to higher office. I want to go in there, hit the ground running, implement that plan the legislature passed, get the Alamo plan in place and done with in four years. You know, they built the Empire State Building in one year total under budget. They built the Golden Gate Bridge in one year on budget. There's no reason we can't go in there and get this thing done and quit fiddling around as we've done so far and be through with it. Uh, the other thing I want to get back to is for 12 years, Cole and I, throughout, off and I, have been working on an Alamo book. Ended up covering the whole war for independence. This got diverted when the Alamo emergency came up last April. It had to be put on the back burner. So in four years, I'm going to have the Alamo done, finished, in great shape, safe for the future, and then we can finally get back and get this Alamo book finally published. Thank you. And Mr. Patterson. I thought Rick was going to take this away from me. <laughs> in eight years, it is my plan to be retired again. Uh, my goal is to return to the land office, fix what needs to be fixed, and then retire again. I think I'm kind of like Rick. I think I can do that in four years, but if it takes two, I will do that. Uh, when I left office, I had no intention of being on the ballot again. I thought Commissioner Bush would do a good job because he was going to keep the people who were experienced. He did not do that. I watched the agency crater. For four months, I was seeking an opponent that had name ID or money or both that I thought could take him out. I found none. So I filed on the last day to ensure that George P. Bush is not the next land commissioner. Eight years, I'll be retired again. All right. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Mr. Lambertson. I saw an article recently. This question, by the way, is for David Evans. I saw an article recently that indicated uh, George P. Bush was uh, taking the credit for uh, reclaiming uh, Texas land by the uh, Red River. Could you describe what happened there and, and how that occurred? How long do I have? <laughs> Ninety seconds. Okay. Okay. So. In 90 seconds, the, the gist of that is the Red River, as everybody knows, uh, and I talked to a few of y'all last year on this, uh, was under federal claim uh, in, in direct conflict with the title ownership of the private property owners along in Texas. And under Patterson's administration, uh, I was I was able to come in and advise uh, some of their leadership and eventually that got me into Washington to help them out. Uh, the lawsuit, the Adderholt uh, VBLM, uh, started off with the citizens and the counties along the Red River. And it took a while for the state to intervene in that lawsuit because they didn't think they had a direct intervention uh, in that lawsuit. I got 30 seconds, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, they did have a vacancy up there where they had 100% mineral interest that was being uh, adversely claimed by the federal government. Uh, when I took that information to uh, George Bush's administration, they didn't accept it, so I ended up having to take that down to the Governor Abbott. 
Uh, and eventually, the very next week, uh, the state general land office did intervene in that lawsuit. Uh, so, yes, I guess they did. Uh, I got to stop. Talk to me later. All right. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Reagan, do you want to pick up on anything on that? I really wouldn't have any comment except to say that from all indications that I've uh, been able to hear, I think it sounds like Davey did an excellent job handling that situation. Mr. Patterson? Uh, the litigation and the controversy started during my tenure, and our problem was we had to find standing. Uh, this is a very interesting area. It goes back to the uh, ODS Treaty of 1815 between Spain, I believe it was, and the United States on the boundary dispute. We had to have some uh, mineral or real property interest in order to intervene. Uh, I went up there, walked the land, uh, walked, visited with the farmers, visited with the, with the uh, landowners, and in seeking, we found we did have minerals, as Davey stated. And Davey uh, initially was uh, working for us, uh, and then completely uh, ensured that we did have minerals. We were convinced we did. Apparently, Commissioner Bush did not believe that, uh, but uh, later decided to believe it, and the uh, litigation was successful, successfully pleaded under his watch. Not only that, though, there was congressional action on our part. I traveled to Washington. I visited with members of Congress. Uh, the gentleman, I can't recall his name, uh, Thornberry. Was it Thornberry? Yeah, Mac Thornberry. Uh, we started working in congressional uh, areas. We started looking at legislation, and then we started demanding that the BLM would have to survey the entire tract of land. You cannot come in and say, this is ours. Yeah. You're going to have to survey. And this is a very large survey. I think in large part they backed off because, frankly, they didn't want the heat and they didn't want to spend the money to survey Red River bottom land. So at the end of the day, we won. It was a combined effort, uh, and George P. took the credit. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Pryor? I think it's obvious George P. will take the credit anywhere he can, right? Um, I have tremendous respect for the efforts that were done in the past on this particular issue and what exactly Mr. Edwards did individually. I think, however, uh, one of the things, and I've already hinted at this with what I've said already, the land commissioner's office, specifically the land commissioner himself, has a tremendous bully pulpit that he can go out and advocate on behalf of landowners in Texas against the federal government. Right now, we don't have that in the Land Commission, and that is exactly what I would be doing as Land Commissioner. Any other questions? We've got one in the back. situation where he was uh, trying to get on the oversight board down there about all the money and the shell corporations that Bush has set up all over the place and uh, they came back and told him uh, well you can be on the board if you come up with $250,000 we'll let you on there so uh, uh, in the old days I would have called that a bribe I don't know what they call it now but uh, my, my position would be that all that money is taxpayer money being expended? It needs to be 100% transparent, uh, which has not been the case. They had to file a Freedom of Information Act request. The numerous attorneys were trying to do uh, reviews of this. They were all stonewalled. And then George P. even told the Attorney General, "Don't rule that these are open to Open Records Act requests." So that all needs to be changed. Uh, I would dissolve all those private corporations except that one Alamo Endowment Fund entity that was 
put in the bill with the legislature to raise private money. All the rest of them ought to be state GLO employees. They're already getting paid by the state every month, reimbursement. So uh, let's get it all out in the open and above board and let every taxpayer in Texas be to see where their penny spent. It's their money. Mr. Patterson. I have to set a standard somewhere. My standard is $5. Everybody give me 10. Got 10 on the bill over here. Now give me 10. I got 25 coming here. 25 on the bill. I'll turn to the other bit. Now help them. Okay, you're in for $250,000. No, the, it's a good point. The point is the ball is being hidden. There are three 501c3 corporations, and the land office to this day has never answered a public information request as to how the money is being used even after the state Republican Executive Committee voted 57 to 1 to demand transparency and 1836 being the focus. That was what the SREC did in September. Now, there's a rumor that there's a change of policy coming, but let me tell you why that change of policy is happening. It's just like the change of policy on Hurricane Harvey recovery. When I filed on, on December the 11th and, and chastised Bush for the failure at Hurricane Harvey and the failure at disclosure at the Alamo, four days later, they signed a contract to do emergency repairs on homes. Four days after I filed, they started giving hell about it. Nine days later, they decided they were going to be transparent at the Alamo. We have already won after I filed on December the 11th. He is reactive. He's hiding out. But he has done some good things. The problem is, pardon my French, you shouldn't have to beat the crap out of somebody to get them to do the right thing. Amen. That's what we've got now. Mr. Pryor? So I'm actually running two campaigns simultaneously. In order to be an independent candidate, I have to get ballot access. Okay? I have to also run as an independent candidate, as a candidate. So individually if you want to support and get a real true conservative alternative on the november ballot we need to be able to actually get the ballot access so unlike the gentleman that are over here with me on the days i can't actually be on your november ballot until i get the signatures march april and may after the primary is done and actually earn my way onto the november ballot and that is exactly what i'm trying to do so that's going to cost money typically a ballot access campaign for a statewide situation like we have here in Texas costs in the neighborhood of three to five hundred thousand dollars if you pay people to go out there and get the signatures. I don't have that money. Y'all don't have that money. We don't need that money. We just need people going out there and getting the signatures. Kelly Cannon's red light camera campaign and what we've done in Arlington in the past in similar situations is a prime example of how we'll do that. So I'm not out here trying to get tons of money and put people on boards, things like that. In fact, honestly, I don't think we need any nonprofit boards down in San Antonio governing the Alamo. Why not just have the GLO work with the Dodge Republic of Texas and just handle it instead of handing it off to unelected people who are not responsible to you, period. Yeah. And Mr. Edwards. So in the 2011 statutes, there's the Alamo Endowment uh, Committee or Board. And that board exists with uh, several members from different groups, such as the City of San Antonio, the Senate, and I believe the House, maybe. I'm not sure. And they are appointed by Commissioner Board. And, and now we've got three other boards, nonprofit boards, where there's non-transparency. Uh, and whenever the Senate Finance Committee back in December asked him about it, he was protecting the members of the board's liability. And my understanding, as a elected official of the state, you should be looking out for the citizens of the state and the taxpayers' money, not the nonprofit board members liability. What are we protecting? So the answer to your question is we shouldn't be paying to be on any board appointment. Alright. One more question from the back. Hi. Mr. Patterson, you might remember this a little bit better than I do. This was a few years ago when this happened. My question is for all of you, but um, 
A few years ago, there was an instance where there was a land grab by George P. Bush's office of a privately held coastal bay area that people from all over Texas would come to and they would fish in it and you know, there was abundant fishing and great vacation spot, you know, the, the privately owned bay, the people that own this bay, they let people come over for free and enjoy it. And from what I remember, um, from what I understand, Bush's office blackmailed the city council where that bay was located, no? Yeah, I, I can well, tell you, on. I can go into great detail. Okay, well, from what I remember, that George Bush's office went, they told the city council they were not going to get any funding or any money from the land office. Do you have a if question? If they didn't take that, yes, I do, get in there. Um, they were going to take that land from in the domain, and they, I guess Bush's office was going to develop it, or they were going to close no, it down. No, uh, uh, I think I know your, I, know, I think I know your question, and I can ask your question, and I kind of explain it. What? Does that stop for who? No, okay. too late to, what, what is the too late to return that land back to the private property. Okay, Here, here's what, what we've done. What would you do to keep eminent domain from happening yeah, again? Here's, here's, what, here's what the circumstances are. If you go east of Galveston Island, there's a peninsula. It's Bolivar Peninsula. In 1954, Texas Parks and Wildlife cut a pass through Bolivar Peninsula for free fishing. Every storm since that time, Bolivar Peninsula has eroded immensely to the point that if we do not close the pass, we will have Bolivar Island. The residents there who live nearby want the pass closed to protect their private property. So uh, the pass is going to be closed. The state of Texas is going to provide money to build a fishing pier into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, first class concrete pier to replace that amenity. But the bottom line is the Texas coast is eroding at at least three to five feet a year everywhere. In this locale, because of this pass, that erosion is dramatically greater and threatening private property. That pass belongs to a rod and gun club and they don't want to give it up. I understand that. It's a wonderful amenity that many people for generations have fished on. But at the end of the day, after Hurricane Ike took the highway out, the two bridges down, now it's just two, two lane bridges, there was a four, and that water movement through there during storms will create Bolivar Island. That's what the story is about. And I, I can tell by your question that, yeah, that, but that's what you're talking about. You're talking about the rollover yeah. pass controversy. That's exactly yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I think I. Mr. Pryor, do you have any comment about that or about eminent domain in general? Well, I think eminent domain statewide, in general speaking terms, is a controversy that keeps coming up over and over and over again on topic after topic after topic after topic. The latest one that we're talking about is the high-speed rail situation between Houston and Dallas, where there is a high likelihood that they will be trying to provide some eminent domain issues to get people's property if they can't do it some other way. And I think that's exactly where the land commissioner, being the state's elected officer in charge of the state's property, should be out there advocating on behalf of property owners themselves and protecting them rather than allowing people to just go ahead and do whatever they want to do. I live in Arlington. We've had eminent domain issues in Arlington at the city level. It's not right. It shouldn't be right. And we need to be getting the law changed out in Austin to protect property owners and it's, it's not happening currently. So maybe if the land commissioner's down there knocking on the legislature's doors, advocating on your behalf, it'll finally happen. And that's kind of what I've been talking about all night, about the kind of job I would do as land commissioner. It's time for we have actual advocacy on behalf of the people of Texas, rather than benign nothing. Mr. Edwards. So as, as y'all, may or may not know, the Texas General Land Office doesn't have the right to use in the domain. And, and so uh, that in on itself is not, you know, strong enough to say that I disagree with them in the domain. It should only be used <laughs> as a last resort for the benefit of the public, not a private organization or some out-of-country uh, benefit. Now, with that being said, the oldest agency in the state of Texas, formed in the 1836 Congress of the Republic of Texas, is the Texas General Land Office. 
all the records that are in that office are titles, Mexican and Spanish titles, and titles and patents from the Republic of Texas and the state of Texas. That's where everybody's title who owns land in Texas comes from. So I agree with, with Andy that, that we should, as a land commissioner, defend private property rights in the state of Texas as well as public land in Texas, the state of Texas borders, like we did along the Red River uh, for those property owners up there. We gave them a huge voice when we intervened in that lawsuit against the federal government. We can do that. And Mr. Range. Well, as a matter of general policy, uh, I would say that eminent domain should always be the means of the last resort. Absolutely. And it should only be used for something that goes directly to the public benefit, not to build football stadiums or shopping malls or make developers rich. And always a last resort, always for the public good. And when it is have to be used, it should be, the property owners should be recompensed with the full fair market value of their property, plus a little bit more for their trouble. Uh, but it should always be used as the last resort. And I think private property rights in Texas should be paramount. All right, with keeping in mind we've got three more forums tonight, I'm going to have to call this as the last question from the audience, and I'm going to have to limit each answer to 60 seconds. And we'll start. I'll let Mr. Pryor be the first one to answer. My question is the last question. Thank you. Well, uh, since you talked about high-speed rail, is it in the domain on the table or is it off the table uh, as, it re as it relates to this high-speed rail? And uh, another question about the permanent school fund. Um, we've got about $1.3 billion invested in U.S. Treasury bills. In the next two years, uh, you've got several million dollars of that retiring uh, maturing with uh, an average uh, interest rate of between uh, 2 and 2.5%. Two and Where should that be reinvested? And uh, the third question is um, relating again to the permanent school fund. There's an early distinction among the candidates about this issue. Uh, some people believe that um, it's a, a cause of lower taxes, a cause of lower property taxes in the state because of what it does for education. Uh, other people, many people believe that it is an excuse or a, a protection for a lower uh, interest rate for the independent school districts. It makes it easier for them to issue bonds. Um, talk a little bit more about that, please. Um, Mr. Pryor has got the first one. Yes. Um, <coughs> trying to remember all three questions, sorry. The, the fact of the matter is, I think there are certain counties along the high-speed rail route that would be willing to have conversations about eminent domain. So I think that's why the, the land commission needs to be proactive rather than reactive. Uh, and, and not just on that, but on other, other eminent domain issues that have come up around the state of Texas. Now, specifically regarding your question of the permanent school fund and, and where those monies are being invested and, and how they be reinvested, uh, my experience in financial markets and things uh, leads me to this point. We don't know what the future holds when it comes to any investment. And so where the investments are made needs to be an ongoing discussion within the, the office, the general land office, making sure that we are maximizing the benefit to the people of Texas of the money that's currently in there. And I do think there's some, there's some connections that need to be drawn with the, uh, with the school districts that we need to talk about. Mr. Edwards? I remember your questions too. Um, as far as the eminent domain, again, like I said earlier, the general land office does not uh, use eminent domain. Uh, advocacy, standing up for private property rights and everything like that. Uh, you know, the commissioner does have, you know, statewide recognition to be able to uh, stand up for that, just like I said earlier with the Red River issue. Now, for the per, uh, permanent school fund uh, lowering, as long as oil and gas is up and high and we're bringing in revenue for uh, generating for the permanent school fund, uh, it, it will lower your, your property taxes, or it should. You know, that's, that's countywide, that's set by the county. Uh, you know, it, it's not directly related that they would do that, but it, it does give that, you know, where they can do that. 
Um, and as for your last question, my, my brain is mush right now, so uh, and I'm getting the stop sign, so I'll pass it on. <laughs> Mr. Range? Okay, if I remember the questions correctly, uh, in the domain in regard to the high speed rail, I'm not specifically county by county knowledgeable to the exact state of affairs, but I would assume that in the eminent domain would be an issue with that project. Uh, as far as reinvesting money for the fund school fund, uh, short answer is invested for maximum benefit and growth and minimal exposure, and you need the best investment experts to handle that. And thirdly, um, uh, the fund school fund. Uh, my understanding is that yes, the uh, Income, not the principal, but any income does go towards helping keep down local independent school district property taxes, and that the principal is also used as a surety uh, uh, for independent school districts to get a lower bond rating and therefore a lower interest rate on bond issues. If regarding the high speed rail, uh, I, I am not a fan. I oppose that, and I'm very concerned uh, that even though the uh, funders and advocates say we are not going to use eminent domain, it's going to be a fair market retail transaction, that at some point they will have to re rely on eminent domain. My real concern is I look at that project and I say that is too expensive. I don't see where they're going to get the money. But my concern comes from the financing that the Japanese government could do to push this over into the economic area and, and make it happen just so they can have a completed project in, in somewhere in the U.S. I'm concerned about the high-speed rail. The, regarding the U.S. Treasury bills, that investment is in the corpus of the fund managed by the State Board of Education, not the fund managed by the, by the uh, uh, Texas General Land Office. The bond rate, you know, the bond rates, uh, you know, are very low interest rates, therefore you get lower taxes. And if that encourages people to borrow money, I think that's, a, that's an issue for the local voters in that school district to fix. All right, uh, I'm gonna give each candidate 60 seconds to wrap everything up, and we will start with Mr. Edwards down at the end. So you only got a few more weeks before you got to make an educated decision. And right now you're listening to you know the, the only candidates that are really passionate about the position. The other one I have no clue what his passion is. But <clears throat> there are two things that you're gonna have to think about when you go down there. And the two things I want you to think about when you look at the names on that on that ballot come March 6th is is this person qualified? Can he actually take care of the general land office, all aspects of the general land office? And two, will he preserve and protect the Alamo in its authentic, historic shrine that it is today for future generations? Mr. Range? I want to ask you all for your vote. I would be deeply honored to have it. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm number one on the ballot, so it's easy to remember. However, that's not how I want to spend my one minute. Uh, this race is more important than one man or one candidacy. It entails the entire future of the Alamo. And I want to tell you all, I think, from my sense, that up in this area, the issue is known about George P. Bush and the travesty that he has tried to perpetrate against the Alamo. However, going to these other counties, I can tell you that 80-90% of the people know absolutely nothing. That has got to change, and it's got to change fast. And the only way we can do it, we've got internet, you can email people. We need every one of y'all. I know y'all got family and friends all over the state. We need every single one of you to contact all of them and ask them to notify everybody they know so that every single voter in this state knows about the situation. I'm sure if they do, Mr. Bush will be swept out in a landslide. But that's what scares me out of this election. We've got to get the word out. Please spread the word. Thank you all. Mr. Patterson. Praise the Lord, Rick. I'm with you. Uh, I ask for your vote because we have a common goal, all of you, all of us. 
and that is to ensure that George P. Bush serves one term in office. I candidly, without any ego involved, believe I can beat George P. Bush. And I've worked, I know these gentlemen, I've known, I've known Rick for eight years, I've known Davey for two, and I would not have gotten in if I thought that the runoff would be between George P. and one of those two gentlemen. If it is, man, I'm on it like a duck in a June bug. I'm on it. But I can beat George P. Bush, uh, and I will beat George P. Bush, and it's going to take more than just working hard. Davey's working hard. Rick's working hard. Our new candidate is working hard. It's going to take somebody with existing state name ID who can raise some money to ensure that George P. Bush is defeated on March 6th or on May 22nd. I'm the guy. I respectfully ask for your vote. And finally, Mr. Pryor. Again, I've got a slightly different path. I'm going for ballot access to be directly on the ballot in November. I will not appear on your Republican primary on March 6th. And that gives me some advantages, even though it's a tough road. One of those advantages is I will be the Republic of the conservative alternative in November if it's George P. Bush again and a Democrat. Who are you going to vote for? If I don't get on the ballot, that's going to be your choices. And that's the, the challenge that I'm trying to present is no matter what happens in the Republican primary, we need to have that alternative come November. And we're going to be out there getting signatures, working our butts off from March through May to get that done. And I would love your support, even though you may be participating in the Republican primary, we need to go the other way and get the signatures and get on the ballot for November. Please join me in giving each of these candidates a hand.